chance I have dropped off, then um, my colleague Chloe is on the session, ready to jump on and um, assist with facilitation. Um, so Berenice has already got her hand up. She's already got a question. <laughs> So, sorry to, to ask Lenny, because this is my very first and I think it's Dan's very first um, attendance at a Derbyshire Dialogue, which is, we're really grateful for you inviting us along. Could we just uh, get a bit more background as to the the kind of what what the meeting's about and how it came about? Just just for a bit of context, I think that'd be really helpful. Thank you. Of course, no problem at all. So we started Derbyshire Dialogue. Um, back at the beginning of um, the pandemic in 2020 as a way of keeping the people of Derbyshire updated on the situation within the um, CCG, as it was then, and across the system, um, particularly around COVID. Um, but we found it a really useful way of reaching out to the communities and um, the people within Derby and Derbyshire um, on various topics. So it's now expanded out and we've had all sorts of things. Um, we still touch on, on COVID. We had a session on long COVID. Uh, mm -hmm. In August, we had a session just a month after we started as the ICB, just to talk through that. But it's not only a useful way for us to share information with the people of Derby and Derbyshire, but also to get their feedback on what is important to them. Um, so we hope to continue it going for a long time <laughs> to come because there's so much to talk about and we understand the importance of this particular topic as well and the interest that people have. But no, that's great. Thank you very much and really do appreciate you uh, taking the time to, to have that conversation with uh, Dan and I. Thank you, Lenny. Thank you. So if I can hand over to you now, uh, just a reminder, if everybody can just pop their cameras off and pop themselves on mute, that would be absolutely great just to enable us all, all to see the slides really clearly. Thank you. Thanks very much, um, everybody. Um, as, as the slide says, um, I'm Berenice Groves. I'm the SRO for Urgent and Emergency Care and Critical Care um, for the system. Um, we, we've configured ourselves in a slightly different way to, to make sure that some of the, the operational, um, I suppose, people that w work within different providers are linked into more of the system work. And I think that's going to really help us as we, we move forward as, a, as an ICB. I'm also the Deputy Chief Exec and the Chief Operating Officer at Chesterfield Royal Hospital. Um, and so, so Dan frequently um, as Programme Director and is doing a sterling job for, for this area, um, struggles to get a hold of me. So he does a lot of the work um, absolutely on his on his own and very autonomously and, and does, a, as I say, a fantastic mm -hmm. job. So um, thank you very much for inviting us along. We're just going to take you through um, winter um, and I, I kind of laugh when I talk about winter pressures um, because the what 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 we've absolutely seen um this year and and certainly since we we hit covid is that we've continued to be under extreme pressure so go, going into winter 22 23 it presents probably different challenges to us we always in the past certainly in the nhs um and and probably slightly less so in social care, we always had some capacity in our back pockets that we were able to, to open up and put additional teams on. Um, and the NHS being the NHS, the way the budget um, always came through with a, a winter pot of um, funding of money um, to, to allow us to develop and put our plans in place. But unlike other winter pressure periods, where because we're in this post-COVID recovery stage, um, we're already in that period of surge. So we are absolutely trying to do everything. And I, I certainly know from an acute perspective, both here at Chesterfield and at Derby, that we have all of our capacity already open um, that, 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 that is required generally for winter. Normally, we wouldn't open that up until probably December time through to the end of March, end of April. Sometimes we cover the Easter period as well. 
Um, it also to say is our surge and escalation has become more frequent and Dan's going to take you through how we manage uh, surge and escalation later on in the slide set. Um, but but because of it becoming more frequent, um, we, we've got into a, a really good battle rhythm with some of the actions that are required to take, making sure that people are held to account, reporting back um, and making sure that improvements happen. And the other area around working very frequently in escalation um, means that uh, we get to know all our partners really, really well. And there's nothing better than a good relationship across the system uh, to, to, to get things done and make sure that they're followed through. So we all help each other out um, across the system. Uh, our system's got comprehensive transformation plans, so alongside reacting on a day-to-day -day basis and putting plans in for, in for winter, we are working through, um, on a day-to-day on a -day basis, we're working through a set of plans um, that will help us um, become much more robust in our delivery of care for patients. And you can see there that it's it's up to kind of five year delivery. We 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 have a plan um, uh, to, to 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 put in place around um, huge improvements out in our community services, um, improvements around how how we deliver primary care, and certainly the access that which has been a, been a problem for us. Um, and certainly a, a number of schemes within uh, the acute trusts uh, very much working towards a, a, an assessment of people before we admit them, because we all know that the worst place for people to be is actually an acute hospital bed. So we try and turn more people around at the front door through that assessment model. So a lot, there's a lot of schemes and, and Dan will um, um, increase on, on, on what we've actually got to deliver further on. Um, I would say that the NHS has been preparing earlier and more extensively, so we've been in conversations and we've been planning um, uh, for quite some time. Uh, previously, again, you would have seen our winter plans go to a November board and get signed off and then it start to implement from December. But because we're in this continual surge, um, we, we absolutely have been in those conversations much earlier. Um, and that the, there has been things that's already been implemented to create extra bed capacity in the hospitals and community as well as increasing um, the likes of call handlers working in NHS 1 and 999, because as we all know, there's huge demand in, in both of those services. Sorry, I'm hearing a bit of... Um, oh, I'll just mute somebody. That's better. Thank you. Sorry. Um, health and social care services. We work together daily. And um, that's what I was saying about the relationship to make sure patients get the care they need. It's it's often a challenge, but we, we do try and work together and operationally on the ground and um, people have conversations and work through different types of solutions for patients so that they get that where, where it's needed most. And the NHS um, England have announced and outlined plans for a number of initiatives designed to make a real impact on the ground, which we, we hope will help relieve some of the pressure on frontline staff. And we're going to go on to talk about some of the challenges that I'm sure you're all very, very aware of because it's been in the, uh, in the press for some time. So if we can move on down to the next one. So the joined up care did, did Joined up care Derbyshire system, can't say Derbyshire, um, go into winter on the back of a six month period, which has seen health and health and care capacity operating at surge escalation levels um, with little opportunity reduced, which I, I've talked about. Um, we have already, uh, some of you probably will have seen in the in the press, um, we did declare some, some months ago a critical incident um, and that was down to the level of uh, demand that was coming through the door, um, a lack of social care capacity at that time that was really causing us problems and was certainly causing issues with us being able to free up ambulances to respond. Um, issues uh, are around flow, which we manage together between us all, um, and it gets that extra level of escalation through all our chief execs. 
In the context of this, our winter plan focuses on four key objectives, and I'm sure none of them again will be a surprise for you, but 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 um, it helps just set that out for you. That what our objective is to reduce acute bed occupancy by increasing step down community capacity. We also need to think about um, during COVID, there was a lot of the elective activity was put on pause. Uh, there's a lot of people been waiting quite a substantial time for their procedures. And I know you've already heard from Plan Care and some of the things that they're doing about um, recovering. Um, but what by making sure that we manage the urgent care demand, what we can do is make sure that we protect some beds so that we can continue with that elective capacity. Because if we don't do that, all that will happen is those elective patients will just end up at our front doors or needing to call an ambulance or needing a GP, another GP appointment. So it's really important that we keep that flow moving and reduce those weights. We also want to um, enhance the resilience of general practice provision and there's some additional capacity going into general practice albeit we know that there are some workforce problems um, to really help with some of the access uh, to general practice. And also the last one is just to provide better support for people at home. There's nothing better than if patients can start, you know, taking responsibility again for themselves. We're, we're, we are, we have become a very dependent um, nation um, and people expect things, don't they? A bit like Amazon 24-7. Um, but there are still a lot of things that we can do ourselves around, around self-care and a lot of things that our community services can support with people at home so that they don't actually have to, to move anywhere at all. Um, reducing the risk of harm is brought, by, brought about by people waiting at home in community for care and ambulance, people waiting on the back of ambulances, not great at all, people waiting in ED for a bed, people medically optimised waiting for, to be discharged, their, their, their condition then deteriorates, they pick up another infection, their mobility is affected, and certainly as I've already described, people waiting for an operation and what can happen around that. So we need to kind of keep that in mind. Just going to quickly trot through these, but it's just to share with you, these are our core objectives uh, for the for the coming winter. So we've got to think about preparing for the variants of COVID-19 and respiratory challenges um, because COVID-19 hasn't gone away at all. And we know that it does impact on people with cardiac conditions, with respiratory conditions. And also think about flu. Um, some of our local hospitals are already seeing a number of um, flu symptoms uh, present at their front doors. And we think that the flu season is just about to start. So a real encouragement there to get your vaccinations, because as we know, um, when when COVID did hit, people were very good at getting their vaccinations and we saw a real reduction in that. Increase of capacity outside the acute trust, including scaling up of additional roles in primary care and releasing annual funding to support mental health through winter. Really, really important, both for staff and for the public as well. Increasing our resilience through NHS 111 and 999 services. There's no point at all, is there, of us keep going out in our communications and asking you to ring 111 rather than just turn and put the front doors of a of an emergency department if we haven't got the, the staffing and the support and the knowledge to be able to support those services. Target our category two response times for ambulance handover delay. So what we're saying there is that we really need to make sure that the ambulances are freed up and can respond to those life threatening conditions. So we need to make sure that we actually offload those ambulances, which I have to say we're not bad at doing um, in, in Derbyshire itself. It's a real focus of ours. Reduce the crowding in A&E departments and uh, targets the longest waits in the emergency department through using kind of our directory of services and looking at alternatives. So we're, we're really increasing the same day emergency care, which is that assessment service and our acute frailty services. Reduce our hospital occupancy through increasing capacity by the equivalent of at least 7,000 general and acute beds through new physical beds, virtual wards and improvements elsewhere in the pathway. 
Um, and the last two, ensure timely discharge. And that is a real challenge. We've, we've be, just been through a 100-day challenge. Um, but when, we're, when we are, have got capacity problems around social care at the moment, which, which aren't going to be recovered quickly, and we need to be really honest about that, um, we, we have to find in, innovative ways of working with the public to, to help us ensure timely discharge. And then the final one I've already discussed, providing that better support at home. Thanks, Dan. Just wanted to highlight to you a few of the, the challenges that we, we are seeing and we know that we're dealing with. One is definitely around ambulance handovers. Um, I've, I've discussed that. The second one around maintaining the elective recovery plans. So we have, we have a judgment call every single day. Um, as you can imagine, the last thing we want is to, to have queues form and, um, and people kind of waiting for, for emergency treatment at the front doors. Um, whilst we, we do have beds that we can put people in, but we're protecting them for elective. So we do need to consider that and make that judgment call. We've got a number of workforce challenges and this has proven even more difficult this year. Um, there's quite a lot of staff leavers and um, there's a lot of people who probably wasn't going to take retirement previously who've who've decided to to take retirement early. Um, there's all, also people moving on to different roles altogether outside the, the NHS. Um, so we've got a lot of focus around making sure that we've got that workforce in place. And this, again, is one of the pressures that we've got, certainly in social care, is, you know, how do you make it an attractive job? Um, I have to say it's not the best paid job in the world. Um, so what can we do to support the staff that actually work in those environments and provide care in people's homes? Um, and we know that we've got up and coming industrial action. Um, we, we we know that the nurses are talking about um, balloting at the moment. We know that the the fire brigade, the ambulance service, we've got a lot of pressures. So we've got to consider that it's not just um, our own organisations, but the wider organisations and the impact that any industrial action can have on us, um, and that that um, cost of living crisis that we're we're certainly working through. The impact of COVID flu as well is is unknown. We've we, we've obviously been we were mapping it really well when when everybody was testing, but now we're not testing everybody. Um, well, constantly the bars are moving. And um, if I was talking to you a couple of weeks ago, um, we had about eighty beds that were filled with COVID patients, and we had some in critical care. Derby had um, one hundred and forty patients that were were with COVID. We were we've reduced that down to around about the thirty and fifty mark. Um, but the, but the levels do alternate, and obviously we have to put arrangements, infection control arrangements, in every time um, this happens. And you know, moving things around, it's just like a constant jigsaw puzzle. Um, the insufficient community care capacity, um, which I've, I've talked about, and then the, the important uh, one around the stability of our private, voluntary and independent care home market. And, market. and when we talk about resolving our discharge P1 capacity, that is absolutely about people being able to support people at home with care. So you hear about people having visits two times a day, three times a day. That's what we're referring to. And then the final one is the available funding. So obviously we're all being asked to achieve a balanced budget. We're all being asked to make savings. There's no more money around and it is going to get tougher. Um, so that, that pot of money to support us with additional um, initiatives this year um, certainly isn't, isn't coming down the tree. So I want to hand over to Dan now because he's just going to talk about in a little bit more detail what we are planning to do over winter and the operational resilience. Thank you, Dan. Thanks, Bernice. So um, I think Bernice has given a really good overview there. And what, what uh, the slides don't articulate is the huge amount of data and intelligence analysis that sits behind trying to get us to a position where we absolutely understand the, the system risks and issues, uh, but understand how we need to matrix work across other areas. And I think we are doing that really collaboratively as a system we we absolutely work with our primary care colleagues our community care colleagues our acute care colleagues and that's why it's really nice um, today to be able to come and talk to uh, talk to, to yourselves 
So you can help us influence some of your friends, family and other colleagues about how you can help us manage um, this winter. So from that from the uh, really good overview of, of analysis that we have done across the system, we've been able to identify um, where we think areas that we need to just dig into and, and improve our planning specifically. Um, so largely, um, as Bernice has explained, one of the main areas that, that we want to focus on is protecting people from COVID-19 and influenza. Um, and I think it's it, COVID is really difficult. There's usually a seven week lead in time at the moment for, for intelligence. But with that being said, I think if we can all help each other with making sure we do um, absolutely uptake the, the flu vaccines uh, and the COVID boosters, then uh, then that would be helpful for us. There will be an element, uh, and, and you'll probably hear this uh, within your communities and within your friends, of, of um, vaccination for fatigue. We need, you, we need to try and get people to overcome that, try and come forward, try to engage with, with making sure that they are uptaking the booster and the flu this year as well to, to really assist um, as in trying to, to manage what will be um, a difficult winter. Um, alongside that, we really are trying to support people in their home in their own homes a little bit differently and make sure we've got um, a specific focus on certain areas such as mental health and, uh, and making sure we can we can improve access for for, for, for our younger people, making sure we've got a, a really good crisis point and community offering. Um, of which I'll discuss later on in what, what you can do for us and, and make sure you've got the right direction for to, to, to direct people, uh, your, your, your friends and family and colleagues to assistance. We absolutely want to um, help um, our older and frail um, patients within, within our communities and we've actually developed a, uh, a, a more of a falls response going forward this year to make sure that we can assist those patients that have decompensated during COVID and are actually probably falling a little bit more than they would normally. And we're seeing that play out through the acute setting. We're seeing that play out in the community setting. That there's quite a lot of uh, patients that we see that are held in our uh, our hospitals are, are, are down to falling. So it makes absolute sense that we put a bit of focus on that. Uh, and as well as, as trying to support um, our, our patients who, uh, who have dementia conditions. There is obviously a, a, a really, we, we need to have a really good focus on, on some of the, um, um, I'd say when, when it says COPD, that's a clinical term, but we're talking about respiratory conditions more than anything. So we need to make sure that we're having a, a good focus on respiratory conditions, especially over the winter period, when you combine that with potential uh, COVID-19 and uh, flu increase. With, with COPD, we end up with pneumonia as well, so we need to make sure that, uh, that we've got some really good focus on that and, and have got mitigations in place for respiratory hubs across the system to, to assist us with that going forward. So a bit more focus on those patients with multiple long-term conditions and trying to reach out to those patients and make sure that they've got the support and help and advice and guidance that they require before we get into that difficult winter period and make sure that they're, they're able to engage with healthcare early on. Um, so providing a, a, an urgent response for, for, those mo for those most in need. So we, uh, as Bernice touched on, we're, we're trying to make sure we've got the right capacity in our 111 services this year. We expect an increase in call volume and activity. So we have been making sure that we've got the right level of call takers uh, within, that, within that function. We're also developing um, a, a Derbyshire um, clinical navigation hub that will be manned by um, GPs and, uh, and advanced care practitioners. So the ability for 111 to pass calls through into that service um, to make sure that our patients are being navigated to the most appropriate place for their condition um, and, make, and importantly, making sure they get a they get an answer to their to their query on the day. So a really good um, bit of transformational work that should come online relatively early in November that should help us and help you navigate uh, navigate the, the system more appropriately. Um, we, we absolutely need to focus on reducing ambulance handover delays and, and we've got um, some, some really good plans in place for that. More of a problem in, in Derby City Centre than, than, than anywhere else. Chesterfield have a really good track record of managing ambulance handover delays. So our primary focus at the moment is trying to assist 
um, Derby with with making sure that they are able to offload ambulances. Now, there's a there's a lot of work that goes in in, in into play with that as well in making sure that the patients that are in the back of the ambulances are, sell, uh, are safe, cared for, and are trying to get into the hospital uh, as quickly as possible. And just a bit of context around that. I'm a paramedic by background. Berenice is a paramedic by background, so we absolutely understand. Um, the the commitment to try and make sure that our ambulance colleagues are, are able to hand over their patients in a, an appropriate time and serve those patients out in the community that are waiting for a response more importantly. So we're, it's a it's more of a heartfelt commitment to us to, to try and resolve that issue for, for Derby and Derbyshire as quickly as possible. But we are um, also helping our ambulance colleagues through the clinical navigation hub as well in taking some of the calls that sit on their stack and making sure that they are um, streamed through into that primary, uh, into the GPs, into the ACP, into the advanced care practitioners, and making sure that they are getting a clinical outcome. Um, I think as, as well as we as we touched on earlier, this isn't just um, urgent emergency care. We are trying to work with other partners such as um, general practice and making sure that they have got the enhanced resilience within their services and working with other colleagues such as Derbyshire Health United in, in making sure we can improve um, the additional hours and consultation times that, that, that we have within our system. As I touched on earlier, we're looking at four county-wide acute respiratory infection hubs, which, uh, which should assist. So you won't necessarily go to uh, an A&E or a hospital setting. You may be directed to other areas to, to, to treat your acute respiratory infection. Um, and I'll just move on to the next slide. So reducing um, discharge delays from uh, hospital, we, we absolutely need to make sure that we improve our discharge processes uh, and the hospital sites themselves are, are doing a huge amount of work internally to make sure that the, the, the patients are being discharged in a, in a timely manner, making sure that they are absolutely medically optimised for discharge and that they should be um, uh, available to go on to their next on onward care setting in, in a in a reasonable amount of time. I think Bernice outlined the the, the, the struggle that we do have with, with some of this in, in making sure that we can discharge those patients out into the community settings um, and through into social care packages of care. And that's a known problem. We are working with our social care partners to try and improve that position uh, and try and reduce the the amount of patients that are held in our uh, acute settings. We, um, we to try and combat that. We are also looking at increasing um, capacity within the system. We are um, looking at virtual wards. So rather than patients being held um, in a traditional ward or bed, they will be held in a in their probably their own home setting where they can uh, be monitored remotely by um, by consultants, uh, primary care, and, and other clinicians. Um, and given a, a, a essentially a phone number to call if they feel that their their condition is exacerbating, and we can monitor it that way rather than help hold people people in hospital. Um, I think it's worth just mentioning people in hospital beds. It's um, it's not necessarily the the best outcome for them if they are medically optimised for discharge. They should be up. They should be walking around. They should absolutely be trying to assist themselves into into moving back into their home care settings. And this is where I'll touch on later, where where you may be able to assist us with some of this. We don't want patients sat in the hospitals de decompensating um, and not being able to to manage themselves when they when they get out of hospital. So just a just a few points there. Um, on the um, elective uh, and cancer care side, for, for, for the elective side, we have been talking to our um, planned care partners. Um, we understand that they their requirement to make sure that we keep our elective care programme up and running. As Bernice said, it is um, a really difficult daily decision trying to make sure that we manage our system appropriately and safely and make sure that we can um, get those elective uh, uh, conditions seen in an appropriate time. We understand the um, that we need to protect a certain amount of beds, um, and we will be trying to achieve the, achieve that over the over the course of the winter if all of our plans work work nicely and we can uh, keep our operational resilience to a to a decent level. Um, so just to give you our plans in summary, because there's 
um, probably just a uh, quite a lot of context there originally. So we need to protect our overnight um, and general acute beds for elective inpatients. We want to reduce our acute bed occupancy, increasing step down community capacity. We want to enhance our resilience for general practice for provision. We need to maximise the use of our same day emergency care services and try and avoid admission. And we need to make sure that we're providing better support for people at home and that you yourselves are, are, are assisting us with that. So just to move on to um, how we monitor and manage operational resilience. Now, this is um, a, a really complex um, one to, to get over to you, but I'll, I'll, I'll try and take any questions if, if needed. So OPEL, as you'll see at the top, it's Operational Escalation Levels Framework. It's a, it's a nationally recognised framework of, to, uh, to monitor pressure within a system, essentially. Um, it was originally from, from NHS England and, and then uh, various different systems have adopted it and tried to bring it in line with what that means for them in, in terms of managing resilience within their system. So it's um, Opal is, is widely known within Derby and Derbyshire. It's been around a good few years now. Um, it certainly helps us out on a day to day basis. All of our providers, all of our uh, partners within the within the area um, report daily their operational escalation level. They've all um, they all have frameworks that sit behind that that explain when they trigger a certain level. So we are able then to collate that as a system. My, our team collate that from a system perspective and then give an overview of where we think our um, our system operational level is uh, as a system. So at the moment, as, as Bernice says, Opel 3 is probably the norm. Opel 4 is getting more normal uh, and, and absolutely we've uh, we've we've called one critical incident and we've avoided one critical incident let's say recently so um it that that goes to show some of the so some of the good collaboration that, that we do do as a, across the system when we get into opel 4 status um and we've been at sat at opel 4 as a system for a, for a period of time notably around two or three days then we make a decision that if we aren't able to de-escalate then we need to escalate further than that and we will look at declaring a critical incident for the system. That then tips us into emergency planning, resilience and response functions and gives us um, gives us an ability to, to make some, some increased difficult decisions that are overseen by chief execs and, and chief medical um, directors across the system. Uh, not an area we like to, to be in at all uh, and absolutely we try desperately daily to, uh, to manage um, in an opera, uh, probably an Opel 2, Opel 3 space if we can, but but it's uh, it becomes increasingly difficult over the over the winter to achieve that. Um, let me just move on. And so, how can you help us this winter? Um, please, please come forward for your um, your booster for COVID nineteen. Please come forward for your flu vaccination. Um, Please be aware of the service that you that you actually require. 111 are a really good resource, either online or by telephone, to give you an overview of, of, of how your um, condition can be dealt with. You don't necessarily always need to go to an, um, an A&E department. They are for emergencies only. Um, please um, have a bit of patience with, with primary care colleagues. They absolutely um, have a lot of daily business that they need to deal with. The receptionists are really good. They may take ask you for more details. They they may try and navigate your um, your your need to a, to a different place other than a GP. There are absolutely other clinicians or the um, other other clinical cl cl clinicians that can assist you other than GPs to um, to uh, to help your condition, such as nurses, such as paramedics, um, such as social prescribers, such as pharmacists. That, uh, that can assist you rather than just GPs or an A&E setting. Um, and then if, um, if, if you want to uh, just dig into some, some keep well messaging this, this year, we've, we've, dropped a, we've dropped a link in for you there. And the, the other area, if, if possible, I'd really like you to, to share with, uh, with your friends, family and colleagues is the, uh, is the mental, help line, mental health helpline. If, you, if you'd do that for us, that'd be fantastic. As I spoke about earlier, um, discharging uh, patients from hospital, we really do need support 
with this, as I think we've um, we've clearly articulated. If you've got a friend or family member that's um, that's in hospital that's due for a discharge, um, it'd be really good if you can help us make sure that they've got some some um, wraparound care as they settle back into their home setting. Uh, and just make sure that they are settled, got everything they need post discharge, and they're just being supported a little bit longer. Um, it's always a really difficult one for, for patients to to be discharged. They still feel may still feel a little unwell. May may just need to get themselves back into their normal surroundings. So if you can assist us with with um, with helping them with that, that'd be fantastic. And please come forward as a uh, as a reservist or volunteer. We um, we would love more people to come forward and assist us in managing um, some of this out this winter. You don't have to be clinical. There's loads of different roles within within uh, health and social care that you can uh, that you can get involved with. So uh, so please come forward with that as well. And I think if I'm right, that's uh, that's us. So thank you. Can I, can I just add a couple of things to the end there, Dan? Um, People probably will be aware that we have urgent treatment centres around uh, Derbyshire as well. Um, and, and in that advice that Dan was giving you there, um, just make sure that, that we do promote those and consider those. Um, we, we've got a, an urgent treatment centre at, uh, for instance, Whitworth, um, and we're about to increase the, the diagnostics. So being able to, to use the, the X-ray machines seven days a week. Um, from from well from this month actually, um, which will be fantastic. So it means any time that you go, um, if you think you've got query a broken arm or whatever, they'll they'll be able to do the whole thing um, at, at that point. Whereas previously they might have had to send you into um, the the local acute hospital. So do do think about those centres. They're they're really skilled workforce that that, that work there and and support those uh, areas. And I've just noticed a couple of comments and I might not have captured everything, but there was a question about not knowing what medically fit was. So th this this is probably from a, a clinical point of view, we, we, we kind of call clinically optimised. So it's the point when um, our doctors have done everything medically they possibly can in a, in a, an acute hospital um, for your care and, and you can get the rest of your care probably in another setting. Now, that might be at home with additional physio. It might be in a community hospital um, with further nursing care, but you don't need to stay within a, an acute hospital. Um, and then there was another question I just noticed about um, the, the rural areas for the ambulance service. This, this is absolutely why we really need to keep those ambulances freed up um, because it is a significant time period for them to be able to respond. And I just want you to be aware that we are working with local hospitals as well because it's not, obviously the ambulances are attached to East Midlands Ambulance Service. And if all of our ambulances are tied up at, say, Leicester Hospital or Nottingham Hospital, we haven't got them to be able to respond um, locally or out in the rural areas. So we're continuing to do that work. You mentioned about rapid response. These are some of the areas that we're working on about putting additional crews on and uh, additional people that could respond quickly and do those assessments. So that's absolutely some of the things that we're looking at. Thanks, Dan. Thank you, uh, Veronica. That was really helpful. I think Lenny's having some um, technical issues, so I'm just going to pick up from there. Uh, so I see in the chat, I mean, it's been a brilliant job of answering the questions anyway. Uh, really helpful update. I know kind of winter is always um, a big thing for the NHS and the wider system in Derby and Derbyshire, so it's really great to see kind of some of the challenges that are faced and then the plans to kind of support patients throughout winter. So thank you. And um, there was just one other question that I spotted, um, and I think Bernice, you touched on infection control uh, a little bit earlier in your slides. And so Carol's asked, are there any plans to create isolation hospitals for COVID patients to avoid cross contamination with other patients as what happened in care homes? Yeah, there, there's no, unfortunately, capacity is a bit of a problem. Um, and one of the things we certainly looked at last year, um, and, and sorry if it kind of shocks people, but we were even talking about putting a mod modular unit into one of our car parks at uh, Chesterfield Hospital um, to, to separate people out, that that might be a solution. The problem is that when you open up additional bed capacity in that way, you've then got... Um, 
you, you, you because you've got a mix of of type of patients that need to be looked after they need to be close to to the acute hospitals um you have then got staff and additional staff and problems and at the moment we're really struggling to um staff the wards that we have already got available to us so what what we try and do is obviously um separate out and have dedicated wards for covid patients um if there is any overflow then we use um with infection control measures and that that's what's really important um we use side rooms um and and again we haven't got a great deal of side rooms at chesterfield they do have the benefit of quite a lot of side rooms at derby um so it makes it slightly easier for for them from from that context but but no we're we're not setting up um kind of these nightingale hospitals anymore we're working within the constraints that we've got thank you we have got a couple of brave people who put their hands up um and i'm sorry i don't know who quite came first so um pete we'll go with we'll go with you first thank you yeah, thanks, uh, Garth. I don't know if you can hear me clear enough. Um, but the, just a, a couple of quick comments. Dan, he was mentioning about, um, I believe, um, you can get in touch with your receptionist and the doctors. And they'll ask you for a little bit more information. Our particular receptionists tend to think they're more consultants than they do actually receptionists. And this is getting quite annoying with a lot of people outside here thinking, well, I've got a doctor to give my information to, and I want them to prescribe me anything I need prescribing, not the receptionist. That's one point. Um, and, uh, and another point um, is virtually gone out of my head, actually. But when it comes to um, services within the NHS, I think really, getting an appointment with a doctor is the major issue in the yeah. first place because you can ring up you can be on the line for a good three quarters of an hour up to an hour and a half waiting to get a receptionist to answer you surely to goodness we've in symphony have been promised a new surgery um one of these soup hoops and this was talked about at the beginning of this year Nothing started as yet. I believe we've got the go ahead to do this. We're, we're having problems now getting an appointment with the doctors, and they say the services are going to be a lot, lot better and bigger, and having more services involved within that area. Surely to God, it's going to get worse for getting appointments in the first place, especially with the area expanding every single day of the week at the moment. Mm -hmm. What would your views be on that one? I'm sorry to chuck it out of you, but it's just something. No, no, it's, really it's needs fine. I don't, I don't about. know if you want to come back on the first point, Dan, and then I can comment on the access. Yeah, I no appreciate problem. It. So, Pete, yeah, I mean, it's it's really it's always a difficult one trying to get into uh, into your primary care surgery, and I think we hear that regularly. To be honest with you, um, primary so Dan, care. Dan, sorry for interrupting you. So, why yeah. isn't things being done about it? Yeah, so, so 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 things are absolutely being done, Pete. The primary care team, and and I'm talking for them, so you'll have to excuse me. Yeah. But the pri primary care um, team are absolutely looking at uh, new models or different models of working. They're still trying to um, trying to work out um, how they navigate each other through through the primary care uh, networks. They there's a there's a new report come forward. If you want to uh, Google the fuller report have a have a good read through that it describes how urgent on the day access needs to needs to work within primary care a little bit differently so there's a, a lot of strategic work happening in the background um that you know we need to make people aware of uh, probably more importantly to make sure that they they are assured that plans are in place to improve access into primary care um, and I guess my point was around the receptionist w was probably around that to be honest with you in that we, we probably need to look at changing the models in in terms of the stigma that usually sits around you know the those receptionists that won't give you an appointment what we need to do is make sure that they're almost patient navigators now they're trying to get you to um, the appropriate uh, person for your for your health need I so not that. not everything needs to see um, a, a GP that we've got we're through um, PCN development, through additional roles um, that, that are coming into primary care. There's think, other, Danny, other sorry clinicians. For, sorry for coming in, Danny, and sorry for talking over you. But I think the biggest issue there is not talking to people like myself. 
who understand the system a little bit, even though I've been a patient, yeah. it's the people outside what you've got to convince. Yeah. And there's them people we've got to educate. I've tried my orders to try and stick up, but, you know, it's the same old scenario. Oh, you're sticking up for them, aren't you? Could you have been involved with them? <laughs> No, it doesn't work like that. No, you know? well, please, uh, please keep sticking up for for, for us, Pete. It's a cost we are you. we are absolutely <laughs> trying to uh, trying to improve it. I mean, the primary care has been around a long time, hasn't it? Uh, and and it needs to it needs to develop, and it is developing. It's just going to take a, a bit of patience and a bit of time, but uh, but we will get there. Um, if we need to explain that further, I'm sure we we can do through various different forums. Let's do that. <laughs> Can I, can I just add as well, I mean, we absolutely are trying to put um, and we are putting additional appointments in um, so that people can access those. I, do, I really do feel for, for receptionists, they do get a, a rough deal. And um, I've, I've seen it myself that they, there's a lot of violence and aggression actually towards uh, receptionists. It's, yeah. it's, it's really sad that when COVID hit, everybody kind of really came together and now um it's the 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 lack of patience that's there um not patience but patience no, um is, is quite stark isn't it um so you know but it, but what i suppose what people don't see is sitting behind the the receptionist is that they've only got a certain amount of appointments they've only got a certain amount of what they can access and they are that that front mm -hmm. door um, we, I know in some of the practices we've started to um, put in place um, digital solutions so people can kind of book in themselves into those areas um, and, and can kind of find slots that are more convenient for them. And I think we need to explore more solutions around that. It's not the answer for everybody because some people can't manage digital um, and the technology, but certainly it, it helps take some of that if you can imagine, you know, hundreds of people try to all form through at the same time, it's it is crazy the way that we run um, primary care services, and we we need to do an awful lot of work with it. And thanks for bringing that up, Pete. Yeah, another problem. Thank you guys for your response, and they appreciate it. Let's see if we can do things, and let's get it actually working, and not as the situation is now, where the government say not funding us and. Uh, we just laid back and we're just taking the you have to excuse me i'm just laid back today you probably <laughs> noticed i'm just being a art lazy uh so and so but go on <laughs> but no appreciate that thanks guys brilliant thank you pete thank you um i'll go to leslie next and i think we've got a couple more in the chat thank you thanks very much bernice and daniel the, the presentation was fabulous i really really have appreciated that thanks i don't thank envy you. you your job i <laughs> think <laughs> but I am very glad that you are so committed to it. Thank you. Um, one of the things I just wanted to raise was that in Glossopdale, we had a, our own paramedic and it works incredibly well. We've, we've unfortunately lost her and we're desperate to get one back again. Um, so one of my questions will be how we're going to do that, but we'll have that conversation at the line. But it, certainly in terms of being able to facilitate communities, her role for us has been exceptional. And if and I totally understand what you're saying about getting everybody involved, and and that was one way that we did it. So it might be a model that that we want to look at. Mm -hmm. The other thing I was going to say to you was, we have patient groups out there that are desperate to work with everybody to try and make this work. And if you're wanting to get some things out to engage the public, then actually working with Hannah Morton might be a good way to go. Certainly in Derbyshire, we're developing the the peer leadership scheme and. That might be something that we can lock into if people have got a specific interest. So I think there are lots of other things if you want to. I mean, I mean, it must be horrendous what you've got already, but it is about who you know and what you know and how we can work together to be the best that we can be, isn't it? Thank you. I, I absolutely. Thank you for that, Leslie. Um, so I've, I've seen obviously the paramedic uh, attached to primary care model work in, a, in quite a few areas. And I, I tell you what, the GPs end up thinking they're an absolute godsend and the patients love it because they, I don't know, they spend, a, I suppose, a little bit more time. And um, well, if you think like me as a paramedic, you explain it in layman terms all the time. So it really it really helps the patients. Um, sort of understand what's happening so it, it is a really good model and what we need to expand on is that multidisciplinary model so the right person goes 
um, but is able to link with colleagues around advice that they might need from another area so that we don't get those duplicate visits all the time. So I'd certainly take that on board. Uh, the communication side of things, um, Dan, Dan will tell you we have a system operational resilience group and every single time we have it, I talk about communications. How can we get the message out there? How can we educate people? Um, so if you, you do have any groups um, and I'm more than happy to, to go and talk to them as well and, and, and talk through the, the detail with them, we would really, really welcome that because the more we can kind of educate the public and, and, and help them understand what services are available, um, the better it is for all of us. Yeah. Uh, and I'll just expand on that. I mean, I think from a from a urgent emergency care perspective, <clears throat> what I'm hearing um, is that probably in most areas in Derbyshire, you, you would like a bit more detail about what is happening about urgent emergency care. And I think we've probably been reliant on our place based teams um, trying to deliver some of those messages, uh, which might not be getting through. So absolutely, we've we've got a team if we need to come and come and give an overview of, of what is happening around urgent emergency care, how we do matrix work into other areas such as primary care, community care and social care. Then I'm quite willing that uh, that we spend a bit of time doing that because I want to make sure that we are absolutely um, getting you to help us with urgent emergency care moving forward. That's that's really good. Thanks, Dan. I'm I'm deputy chair of, of High Peak Alliance in High Peak, um, and I will certainly feed that back to them because I think it's something that we would look at as a whole. Yeah, we'll really uh, we'll, we'll share email addresses and and please, Leslie, get in touch. Okay. Thank you. To, to, to be honest, that would be a great area. Um, one of the things that um, certainly through the height of winter last year, Leslie. Um, we know that we've got the struggles with social care. And I did see that somebody had been on Breakfast TV and well done. Um, thank you for, for everything that was being said. But we were really putting pleas out to families um, and, and friends to support and, and help us. Um, and, and that message, it would be really helpful to kind of talk through some of those issues. Um, certainly in the more rural areas where it's it's even more difficult, if you can imagine trying to to get to a house, you know, in, in, in one area, certainly gloss up and then have to travel another 20 miles to another house um, and all do it all in a, in a time frame. Um, anything that families can do to support with some of that care is is a great assistance to us. That'd be brilliant. OK, thank you all. Um, we have just got one more question. I don't know whether this one might be best um, picked up offline. Um, I know there's quite a lot of national um, evidence out there, but Tony has asked, what evidence do we have on the safety of having both COVID and the flu jab together? Yeah, I certainly I would I would like to um, ask the experts around yeah. that. I know I had both of mine together and um, I was very lucky. I had no uh, side effects at all. I was absolutely fine, but um, I'd, it, it'd be good to just explore that further. Yeah, brilliant. I can pick that up with um, Tony outside of this. That's all right, Tony. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good question, though. Yes, um, I think we've got, we've got some great feedback in the chat and you might have seen I don't think we've got any more specific questions. Leslie, is that a legacy hand or have you got um legacy hand? OK, no worries. Uh, so if there are any more questions, then please um, pop your hand up or put it in the chat. I know we've only got five minutes left, so conscious of time. Uh, but if anyone's got any questions outside of this, uh, please do send them to the engagement team email. I will pop it in the chat again and we will send around the slides after this meeting um, along with some details on the next Arbyshire Dialogue. So hopefully we should see you all there in the next one. Uh, but if there's no more questions, um, thank you very much again, Berenice and Daniel, that was really, really helpful. Um, and thank you everyone for coming. Thank you all. Thank you very much indeed. And I, and I have noticed some of the additional comments that we can feed into our, our winter plan, certainly about the distance to Whitworth for the elderly, etc. You know, I, I, I will take that all on board. Thank you for that. Brilliant. Thank you all.